everybody. Welcome back to Hoffman Reproductions. Thank you for tuning in with us once again today. Well, this time around I'm coming to you obviously indoors. I plan to make this video outdoors, but it's extremely windy today, so I don't think the audio would have cooperated very well. But uh, as the name implies, something a little different. We are going to talk about the story that allegedly claims Daniel Boone shot and killed a Bigfoot. So, uh, be interesting and fun, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I came by this story while doing some research on Daniel Boone, and I thought, well, maybe this was just something that got started in the 60s or 70s when Bigfoot was kind of taken off. But upon looking into it, found that this story is recorded pretty far back in the time period. I came by it by way of the Lyman Draper manuscripts. Now, Lyman Draper was a historian during the 19th century who took it upon himself to record many of Daniel Boone's stories and adventures um, through interviews with family members and friends that Daniel Boone knew. I'm not sure if he ever actually interviewed Daniel Boone himself but uh, they're pretty vast in array and are thought to be a pretty good resource for those wanting to learn about the history of Daniel Boone. Uh, historians today still use them, so that's where I came across this story. Um, unfortunately, the first part of this story, I printed this uh, manuscript off many months ago and misplaced one of the pages that lays out the beginning of kind of how, when, and where this story took place. But the cliff note version of it is, as far as the beginning goes, uh, Daniel Boone was at a social gathering later in his life, and he was one of the keynote speakers. And when he stood up to speak, whatever he was going to talk about, um, someone in the crowd asked if he would share the story of the time when he allegedly shot a large hairy man, a.k.a. Bigfoot, and several in the crowd said yes, you know, we had heard the story out of Daniel Boone's uh, own lips. Except for one gentleman, one gentleman, I forget what his name was, declared that the story was impossible, it was a fake, and uh, wasn't going to have any of it. And Daniel Boone, apparently, uh, as long as this guy was heckling him, said, no, I'm not going to talk if this is the way it's going to go, and sat back down and refused to speak. So... After the crowd had kind of broken up, a young man whose name escapes my mind uh, accompanied Daniel Boone and a small group of men that were heading to um, a friend of Boone's who owned a store there to relax and enjoy some refreshment uh, after the festivities had broken up, and that is when our story takes off. All right, so now we have the story, and this is as it was recorded by Lyman Draper from this young man who was present at this small gathering with Boone and shared the story with him. So this is the words of the uh, young boy at the time. Okay. On our way to Mr. Motcher's residence, I walked beside Colonel Boone and said to him that when he wished to leave the party, for him to give me a square of the arm and I would get his hat and we would quietly leave by the back way and come back to the store. He said, Thank you, honey. I shall depend on you, for I dislike to be in crowds where I have to receive so much attention. I was surprised at his giving me the signal about nine o'clock, though delighted with the hope of hearing the story of the giant. On reaching the counting room where we had plenty of fine apples, I said to him that I'd long to hear the story about the giant. He replied, you shall have it, honey, but I would not have opened my lips to this time if that man had remained, the man that was heckling him in the crowd, apparently. All right, Colonel Boone's story of the giant. He said it was in the spring of the year that he was living in Boonesboro, and the corn was about half a leg high, that on getting up one Sunday morning, he found his two horses had been stolen by Indians. He saw signs that they were two Indians, numbering two. He and his son immediately got ready and went in pursuit. They pursued the track to the headwaters of the Hinkson Creek to Kalk Spring, which had had the date of February 1778, which had been cut down on a tree by uh, William Kalk, who entered the land and was living on it when he knew him. 
Boone was present when the tree was marked. The pursuit, the track down, and the creek they'd crossed. The little mound where Mount Sterling is now located. They pursued the track down to the creek to where it empties into the Licking River, which they crossed to the right bank and pursued. The track went down the Licking River to the Ohio, where Cincinnati now stands. They had come so near upon the Indians that their fire was still burning where the Indians had stayed before they crossed the Ohio River. He and his son immediately made a raft and crossed over, but on ascending the opposite bank they found the signs of about 500 Indians. They knew that further pursuit was useless and turned back and landed below the mouth of the Licking River. It was about 3 o'clock in the evening, intending to go about 10 miles down to the spring that he knew of, which came out at the foot of the hill where there was fine open woods and grass, usually abounded in deer, and they stood in need of provisions, as they could shoot none whilst in pursuit of the Indians for fear of putting them on the alert by the report of their guns. They found a spring and encamped. There was some rain that night, and the next morning was foggy with mist. The hill ran in the direction of their home. Boone took one side of the hill and his son the other. As they walked about the same speed, they could be in hearing of each other's guns. At about 10 o'clock, the fog having cleared off, he heard his son's gun fire and immediately heard it fire again. From the last report, he knew that the bullet had been put down by his son without a patch. He immediately hastened to the crest of the hill as he feared that his son had either shot a bear or a panther and had wounded it and had made fight with it. But on reaching the top of the hill he could not see his son anywhere, but on looking for a moment he saw him 250 yards away from the largest man he had ever seen. He was walking very fast with his face set at a particular direction. On casting his eyes in the same direction he saw his son behind a tree loading his gun, and the giant about 75 yards from him. He immediately leveled his gun, but there were so many trees, and the giant walked so fast that he was afraid to shoot for fear he might miss. The giant got up to his son and caught him by his buckskin dress, and with one hand while with the other he jerked the gun from him and threw it and broke it off at the breech. Then catching his son by the nap of the neck and the seat of the breeches, raised him up over his head just as easy honey as I would raise up a child and slammed him on the ground. And he raised him the second time and slammed him in the same way, for I was afraid to shoot for fear of wounding or killing my son, but knowing that I had to shoot or a third slam would be sure to kill my son if it had not already done so. While the giant was stooping to raise him up a third time, I fired and the giant fell over on my son. I immediately ran up and jerked him off my son and found my son senseless and not breathing. I immediately made every effort to rest, excuse me, to restore his life. It seemed to be more than an hour before he breathed. He finally came to after using water flowing freely from my canteen so I was able to recover him and set him up against the tree and was glad to find no broken bone. In about an hour more he stood up and talked. I asked him where he had aimed to strike the giant and that he had aimed to hit him in the heart both shots. The giant was naked. I turned him over on his back and found that both of the bullet holes near the left nipple and about two inches apart but neither of them had entered the body but passed around and came out the back. I then passed my finger into each of the holes and found the giant had no ribs but solid bone about three quarters of an inch thick which I found by cutting through the bone with my tomahawk. My own shot struck him in the left eye which was fortunate. The giant was not an Indian for he was pale yellow with long yellowish hair and not black as is common amongst the Indians. His body was likewise covered with short hair not very thick. His teeth were all naturally grown together in his head with rather small eyes and a nose with very large feet and hands. When we stretched him out and cut a walking stick to measure, 
We measured his length, and measuring with my hands, I found that he was at least ten and a half feet high. My son then got another, another walking stick to measure, as one of them carried by my son and me carrying the other one returned to Boonesboro, where we measured them by the squares when we found out the height to be ten foot eight inch tall. This is the story of the giant that was given to me by Colonel Boone. I asked them if he had ever heard of any such amongst the Indians and what they knew of them, if anything. He said that they had a tradition of giant men and a giant beast, but the Great Spirit had killed them all somewhere on the Osage River. So there you have it, guys. The time Daniel Boone claimed to have shot and killed a Bigfoot. Uh, take it for what you will. I'm not going to turn the channel into some kind of a Bigfoot fan club. I just came across that story while researching Daniel Boone. I'd never heard it, but perhaps some of you have never heard it and would like to. So that's going to do it for now. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll see you again next time.